Good morning and welcome to this morning's Easter Reflection. Now, our Bible scripture is John 13, 21 to 28, and you can read the actual account in your own time. But just to give you a bit of context this morning, this is Jesus' final meal with his disciples. Now, he knew the significance of this gathering, even if they didn't. He began the evening by washing their feet, his act of humility and love kind of just bowled them over. They had no idea what was going on. Jesus was teaching them what it means to love and to serve, and to honour each other. This was a meal with friends, people who'd walked with Jesus and with each other throughout the three years of Jesus' ministry. The Bible captures the highlights of all the people that they met and the interactions and the miracles and the stories along the way. But just to put a kind of human imagination onto it, I can imagine that there's an awful lot that goes on behind the pages of the Bible that we don't see. The, the tears, the anxiety, the laughter as they walked together and learnt to be with each other in the highs and the lows. This was a family meal. Many having left their own flesh and blood to follow Jesus, they'd become brothers to each other. They were for each other and with each other. I'm sure that there was a lot of discussion going on around the foot washing as they reached over to pass food to each other and maybe there was some question marks and misunderstanding that was going on. All of this was happening and then we get to this one little verse. In the middle of all of that, verse 21 says, Now Jesus was deeply troubled. I stopped at this point when I was reading. I find great comfort when I'm reminded that Jesus isn't just sympathetic, but he em- empathises, get the right word, he empathises with us. He fully understands and shares our pain. He doesn't stand from a distance with wise words, but he draws close because he has a real understanding of what we go through as humans. He wasn't troubled, his deeply troubledness wasn't because of their discussion or their lack of understanding. But he was deeply troubled in the core of who he was. As he exclaims, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. I read a quote the other day that said this, the saddest thing about betrayal is that it never comes from our enemies. Jesus understood and fully identified, knowing from his own experience, one of the greatest pains ever known to the human heart. When someone you believe is for you sets their heart against you, there is no pain quite like it. The damage of betrayal is deep. And even as I'm reflecting on this this morning, it may be that your mind has automatically gone to a memory. You've immediately been drawn to a story, an experience that is so vivid in your mind. Periods in your life when you felt betrayed, where a confidence was violated or a weakness exposed, where a trust was broken or when you uncovered a disloyal act against you, a lack of integrity or honesty. And if I asked any of you that were listening this morning to put your hand up, if you've ever found yourself in a situation like this at any stage during your life, I'm sure every hand would be up. And some of you have actually got both hands up. You know the pain of betrayal. Now I can imagine the discussion that followed Jesus' utterance. No one around this family, friend, table, no one could imagine betrayal could ever be possible. Who around the table? Which friend? Which brother? Which family member? And I'm sure we've got little snippets of it, but I'm sure that there were those that were going, well, it can't can't possibly be. It's It's not me. I would certainly never do anything like this. Jesus wasn't just talking about what Judas would do. We all know that Judas was the betrayer around that table. But Jesus wasn't just talking about what Judas was about to do. 
He was talking about the fact that Peter, his friend, would deny ever having known him. That those people around that table who were saying, not me, not me, would run away and desert him. Jesus knew that he would feel betrayal when those that heralded him in as king shouting Hosanna would be the very same ones that would shout crucify him. He knew that he would feel betrayal when he wouldn't receive the justice when a criminal would be set free instead of him. Jesus understood betrayal. He knew what it felt like. Unlike Jesus, we can find ourselves with a foot in both camps, can't we? We easily and readily, readily identify with Jesus and that deeply troubled sense that we carry when things have been done to us or where we feel we have been wronged. We find those stories easy to recount and easy to remember and sometimes we can be guilty of carrying those things to our deathbed. We don't find it as easy to own up to having a foot in a camp of people that weren't around when Jesus needed him the most, needed them the most. We find it less appealing to identify ourselves as being part of a problem. We would rather think about the things and concentrate on the things that cause us pain and pay little regard possibly to the things that might cause others pain that we have been part of. You see, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the beginning of this story, he knew exactly what was going to happen and he knew exactly what these disciples would do. He knew that when it mattered, they wouldn't be there, that they would deny having ever known him, that they would run a million miles and be associated with him. And yet he still chose to demonstrate love and servanthood and humility towards them. It was his act of grace and kindness to those that would be perpetrators. That's grace. And at the end of the story, after the crucifixion, after it's all gone wrong and Peter basically has given up, he goes back to fishing because he is that just feels absolutely written off by what he did. Jesus goes back out to find him and calls him back to serving him. That's the grace of forgiveness. Jesus doesn't leave us in a place of pain or shame. There's grace for both. And as I was thinking about this this morning, I was reminded of a song that we used to sing many, many years ago. And it says, um, God forgave my sin in Jesus name. I've been born again in Jesus name. I think that's it. And, and in Jesus name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. And the chorus says, freely, freely, you have received, freely, freely give. You see, when we understand that we were firmly in Peter's camp, we were firmly there, that we have been part of the problem and yet we stand forgiven. It gives us the capacity to be gracious to others who have wronged us in the same way we've received forgiveness is the same way we need to offer, freely offer forgiveness and love to those who have sinned against us. And isn't that what Jesus modelled on that day? That there's grace for our shame and there's grace for our pain. And this morning, if things have come to your mind, I want to encourage you to take some time to forgive and to be forgiven. Today is a new day. Today is a new day. There is grace for your shame and there is grace for your pain. And we're going to close by just saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. Let's reflect on that. As we forgive those who have or who had or who 
will trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day. Join us tomorrow. Bye.